from Bloomberg News and iHeartRadio, it's The Big Take. I'm Wes Kosova. Today, can Supreme Court justices be trusted to oversee themselves? A series of recent reports documenting justices' failures to disclose gifts and real estate deals has sparked questions about possible reforms. Including luxury vacations for Thomas, a portion of his wife's salary. This was one heck of a trip. This is not some fishing trip. A $500,000 island hopping trip. It reveals trip. the same conservative activist who paid for Thomas's vacations and bought his mother's home also paid for his grandnephew's private school tuition. For weeks now, the U.S. Supreme Court has been in a harsh spotlight after disclosures that raise potential ethics questions about some of its members. Most notably, Justice Clarence Thomas, who didn't report lavish vacations and other financial benefits he received from a Texas billionaire. And he's not alone. Justice Neil Gorsuch and even Chief Justice John Roberts have also come under recent scrutiny. Some prominent lawyers and legal scholars and members of Congress are now calling for more transparency along with stronger oversight of the justices. But the court has forcefully pushed back. This makes them, again, the only judges in the U.S. who have unlimited discretion to decide whether they're disqualified in a particular case. That's Stephen Lubit. He's a law professor and an expert on legal ethics. I talk with him in just a bit about what, if anything, the Constitution has to say about who has the power to oversee the justices. First, Bloomberg Supreme Court correspondent and friend of the Big Take podcast, Greg Store, is back to sort through what's happening. Greg, usually when you come on the show, we're talking about thorny issues that are before the justices. And today it's kind of odd because we're talking about thorny issues about the justices. Yeah, it's been uh, quite the season for ethical controversies at the Supreme Court, most of which are connected to Justice Clarence Thomas. So there's Thomas, and then there are also questions surrounding Chief Justice John Roberts and also Neil Gorsuch, one of the newest members of the court. Can you just walk through what the various questions are about each of them? Sure. And I would say that certainly the questions about Roberts and Gorsuch are on a a much lower tier than the questions about Thomas. The John Roberts issue has to do with his wife's work. His wife is a lawyer. She worked as a practicing attorney before he joined the Supreme Court. And then she shifted to become a legal recruiter. And so the questions about them have to do with the payments to her from firms who do work before the Supreme Court. No indication that it has violated any established ethical rules. And, you know, really, some people, when you talk to ethics experts, say what Jane Roberts did was actually what you're supposed to do. She kind of got herself out of the line of fire so that she's not working at a law firm that is actually practicing before the court. She is instead kind of off to the side, serving their interests in a different way. The factor on the other side is... Jane Roberts is an independent person, and she has a career. And the questions we need to ask are, do we want to keep a spouse of a justice from pursuing their own career because of some, you know, somewhat indirect potential for some sort of conflict? So there's Chief Justice Roberts' situation. Neil Gorsuch also has had some questions about a real estate transaction. Right. So this is mountain property that he owned with a couple other people that was held in an LLC. And he sold that property, or the LLC sold that property more specifically, and that's important, just after he was confirmed to the Supreme Court. They'd been trying to sell it for a while and had a little trouble finding a buyer. And it turns out the buyer is somebody who is a very successful lawyer. And Justice Gorsuch, on his financial disclosure reports, did not indicate who the buyer was of this property. Really big questions about whether he needed to disclose that particular piece of information. I don't know that that is clear. Also not clear that the property sold for anything other than the market rate. The buyer said he's never actually met Justice Gorsuch. And so there's some real questions about whether there's anything at all to see there other than perhaps that it would be nice to have uh, more fulsome disclosure rules so that this information might have come out earlier. 
So both of these instances really came out after there started to be very close scrutiny of the justices when these other details started coming out about Clarence Thomas. Right, exactly. I think part of what happened here is that folks in the media collectively realized that there's some information in these financial disclosure reports that maybe isn't as complete as, you know, or raises a lot of questions. And so folks started looking into, you know, various aspects of various justices. And yes, you're absolutely right. I mean, what really sparked this all was that the first report, the first of now several reports in ProPublica about a wealthy Republican donor, Harlan Crow, paying for very lavish vacations for Clarence Thomas and his wife. And tell us about Harlan Crow and what that relationship with Clarence Thomas was. He is a Dallas-based businessman, real estate developer. He says he met Clarence Thomas in 1996 after Justice Thomas joined the court, and they became friends. And for more than two decades, they have gone on vacations together, including places like Harlan Crow's yacht and, you know, exotic locations like Indonesia. And... Clarence Thomas has not been paying for these, and he also had a number of private jet trips. This is all documented in the ProPublica report. And very little of this was disclosed in Justice Thomas's financial disclosure reports. And his argument was that he was not required to disclose them because Harlan Crow didn't have business before the court. Yeah, and also because the disclosure rules create an exception for personal hospitality. So there's not a whole lot of question. If he just goes and stays for a weekend at Harlan Crow's house, he doesn't have to disclose that. The questions had to do with, well, what if where you stayed wasn't actually owned by the individual? It was owned by a company. There's some fuzziness to the rules. They have since been clarified going forward, but the argument that Justice Thomas made was that he, he said he consulted some of his colleagues and concluded he did not have to disclose these. But our Bloomberg colleague Zoe Tillman looked through many years of Supreme Court cases and found one where one of Crow's companies did have a case before the court. Yeah, so in Justice Thomas's statement after the first ProPublica report, he said, Harlan Crow did not have business before the Supreme Court. And what Zoe found was there was a case almost two decades ago where Trammell Crow Residential, which is a company that Trammell Crow is the name of Harlan Crow's father, and Harlan Crow's company owned a portion of Trammell Crow. So an interest in the case, they actually did have a case at the Supreme Court, just a case that the Supreme Court turned away. Trammell Crow had one down below. It had to do with the rights to these architectural plans. The Supreme Court turned it away. No indication that Justice Thomas recused. We have no reason to think this was actually seriously discussed at the justices' conference or that they had any serious chance of taking it up. But it was a case where a company connected to Harlan Crow did indeed have business at the court. And then there's a separate issue that more recently came to light about Crow and Thomas having to do with paying for tuition. So Clarence Thomas and his wife, Ginny, raised where Clarence was the legal guardian for his grandnephew, who had a very troubled background. And they took him in at a very young age and raised him, Clarence Thomas has said, like a son. And so the new report says that Harlan Crow paid for a couple years of tuition for this boy at private schools, including a military academy. That also was not disclosed in a tweet one of Thomas's confidants, Mark Paoletta, a lawyer here in Washington, said, A, it didn't have to be disclosed, and B, this was actually an act of extreme generosity on the Thomas's part to take this boy in and take care of him, and they described it as a, a left-wing smear job. And there is yet one more financial transaction between Crow and Thomas that has been the subject of some scrutiny. Yeah, so Clarence Thomas... He and his some family members had some property in Savannah, Georgia, the house where he grew up. And Harlan Crow bought that property. And it includes a house where Clarence Thomas's mother still lives. And Harlan Crow paid for some improvements to the property as well, built a carport. Again, this is all stuff that was not reported by the justice. What has Harlan Crow said about all of these various things that have come to light? He has essentially said, I am doing things for a friend, that the Thomases are dear friends of mine. In the case of the house, I was buying that because I thought it would be you know, to create a museum at a later point. You know, here's where Supreme Court justice grew up. He has, in the case of the grandnephew, said, look, I have 
done this for at-risk kids a lot. I have paid for tuition because that's something that I think is important. And he has you know, said, I do not have any business before the Supreme Court. I am doing this as a friend. And then there is finally one more question surrounding Clarence Thomas, and that's the political work of his wife, Ginny Thomas, who is one of the strongest advocates arguing to challenge the results of the 2020 presidential election. Yeah, we almost forget about this because we were so engrossed in the money spent by Harlan Crow. But yes, Ginny Thomas is a conservative activist was actively encouraging folks in the Trump administration, in particular Mark Meadows, the chief of staff, to do more to try to overturn the results of the election. Those text messages have been made public. I would like to thank a great woman named Ginny Thomas. Do you know Ginny Thomas? She's a great woman. The wife of a great man, Justice Clarence Thomas, for her courage and strength. She said that she still believes the 2020 election was stolen. She didn't wilt under pressure like so many others that are weak people and stupid. Clarence Thomas has not recused himself from any case related to the January 6th riot at the Capitol, including a case about whether White House papers that would have revealed some of this information about his wife, whether those would get turned over to a congressional committee. That's the kind of the pre-existing controversy before all this other stuff came out. This all raises this question about what justices are required to disclose and what they should disclose. Because even if they don't run afoul of any ethics policy that is written in some regulation, it doesn't look so good. Yeah, so the Supreme Court alone among federal judges is not bound by any code of conduct. There is a code of conduct that applies to other judges, and the Supreme Court has said we look to that for guidance and we essentially follow it. But there is no enforcement mechanism. So if there's an allegation that a Supreme Court justice violated the code of conduct that they say they follow, there's no way to have that looked at by some sort of independent body to determine whether there was a problem. They police themselves. They essentially police themselves. Exactly right. A lot of people, particularly Democrats in Washington, are not satisfied with the idea that the justices are policing themselves, especially because of all of these things that we're talking about here. And there has been a push to try to impose some ethical standards that the court itself would have to follow. But Chief Justice John Roberts has pushed back very forcefully against that. Yeah, he really has. When Dick Durbin, the chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee, tried to get John Roberts to come testify, It is critical to our democracy that the American people have confidence that judges cannot be bought or influenced and that they are serving the public interest, not their own personal interest. Roberts not only said no, he did it in a letter that didn't really acknowledge there was a problem here. He just said, look, chief justices don't come testify. You know, it's basically never happened in history. And they attached this what they called Statement of Ethical Principles and Practices, which all nine justices signed, which basically just regurgitated things that he and others have said before, this is how we do things, and didn't really advance the ball very much. So there wasn't a whole lot of acknowledgement or acceptance of the notion that maybe another branch of government has a legitimate concern. John Roberts has always been very protective of the court's reputation, and he's pushed back against charges that the court is political. You would think that because the justices are the final arbiters of constitutional questions, these very weighty matters that come before it, that Roberts himself would want to make sure that there was no even appearance of something wrong. We were talking about the case of his wife, talking about Neil Gorsuch, and these are very kind of gray areas, that they wouldn't want any sort of those questions, that they would be beyond reproach. Well, let me try to be generous towards the chief justice and say, undoubtedly, he's in a very tough spot. Whatever he thinks about what Clarence Thomas is doing, he really only has two choices. He can defend Clarence Thomas. He can come out and criticize him. I guess a third choice, he can do what he's doing, which is essentially nothing. But neither of those first two choices work very well for him. I mean, if he's going to, you know, come out basically at war with Clarence Thomas publicly, A, that's not necessarily going to make the judiciary look any better, and B, he is potentially really alienating an important colleague. And if he defends Clarence Thomas, well, A, he may not believe that, and B, that probably only makes the court look worse. He's not doing anything. So, you know, the chief justice 
we call him the chief, but he's not the boss of the other justices. He has a few special roles. He, you know, gets the bigger office. He's got a couple ceremonial and, and maybe slightly not ceremonial roles, but he doesn't have the authority to impose something on his own. Now, it's not always crystal clear what the chief can do in his own and what the court as a whole has to do. I took that statement that they issued as essentially the best that Roberts was able to produce. He got a statement that nine of them signed, saying, we take ethics very seriously, here's what we do. He may well have wished he could get them all to agree to a code of conduct in some binding mechanism. The question for him was, would he want to do that if it wasn't unanimous among the justices? And if one justice said, you know, I disagree with that and I'm not going to follow it, Roberts doesn't have a clear way to make that justice follow any code of conduct. But Greg, would Roberts have to criticize Clarence Thomas or other colleagues? Couldn't he have just said, as the Supreme Court, we have to be beyond reproach. And so what we're going to do is say that we'll follow the same ethical guidelines that other federal judges have to follow just to make sure that there aren't any of these kinds of questions about us. So he certainly could have said that. And the word I would focus on is the we. When he says we are going to do that, does Clarence Thomas agree to do that? And if Clarence Thomas doesn't agree to do that, what does John Roberts do? It's not all that clear. And, you know, maybe if he is skillful in his relations with his colleagues, maybe he can thread that needle. But of course, at the same time, he's negotiating with them over, you know, big cases on affirmative action, student loans, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, there are a lot of things, a lot of dynamics going on within the court. And it may be that this was just, you know, one consensus that Roberts just couldn't build. After the break, will Congress step in to impose rules on the Supreme Court? Greg, as you've said, the court is pushing back against the idea that they should change their ethics reporting rules. Do you think that there's any chance that Congress will now step in and try and do what the court won't do itself? It's hard to imagine Congress will do much in this current environment. The current environment being we have a divided Congress with Republicans in control of the House. And we saw at the recent Senate hearing about these very issues, these Supreme Court ethical issues, a lot of Republican pushback on the idea that anything at all needed to be done. So we can talk about ethics, and that's great, but we're also going to talk about today of a concentrated effort by the left to delegitimize this court and to cherry-pick examples to make a point. So... Never say never. We don't know what next story might come out and what might change the dynamic. But as of right now, the way this is playing out in Congress is basically, you know, a partisan fight. And with Congress divided, it's hard to see what emerges from it. Do you think that these questions being raised about the justices themselves, especially in this very political environment, does harm to the reputation of the court, that it lowers the faith of Americans in the Supreme Court? It's hard to see how it doesn't. I mean, certainly you look at public opinion polls and you're seeing it. The numbers are way down. And this all, of course, happens against the backdrop of a court that has become much more conservative through Republicans pushing really hard to get their nominees confirmed and keep Democratic nominees from being confirmed, or at least keeping one Democratic nominee from being confirmed. And major decisions, especially the one overturning Roe v. Wade and the constitutional right to abortion. And so you had this sort of pre-existing unhappiness with the court in its direction among a very large segment of the country. And this just adds to that. And do you think there's any political pressure that would lead Clarence Thomas to step down? I cannot see it, Wes. I mean, you know, I was talking to some colleagues about this. You know, if we think about, like, what made Richard Nixon resign, what made Abe Fortas, who was a justice when Richard Nixon was president, both of those happened when that person lost support among members of their own party. Richard Nixon resigned in large part because the Barry Goldwaters of the world said, Mr. President, you need to resign. At this point, Clarence Thomas has not lost any significant chunk of the support he has among Republican members of Congress and conservatives across the country. So until that happens, it's hard to see how there's any sort of critical mass of pressure that would you know, cause him to think about stepping down. And I haven't even mentioned the fact that if he does step down, we have a Democratic president and a Democratic Senate, and that's going to shift the Supreme Court. <laughs> 
Greg, always great talking with you. Thanks for coming on the show. My pleasure. Now let's hear from someone who has closely studied these questions. Stephen Lubit is an emeritus professor of law at Northwestern University. He's written for years about judicial ethics, including the court's current situation. Steve, I think for a lot of people who are seeing what's happening now with the Supreme Court, the question is, why don't Supreme Court justices, who you would think would want to be beyond reproach, don't follow the same ethics guidelines that every other federal judge in the nation has to follow? They would claim they follow the same guidelines. They just haven't formalized it into a code, which I think is sort of silly. The reason they don't have a code is just because they don't want to. You know, they're the Supreme Court. They get to decide, and they've made this decision, and they're sticking to it. In 1972, the American Bar Association published what they called the Model Code of Judicial Conduct, setting mandatory standards for judicial conduct that they hoped would be adopted across the board by American judges. And one of the very first early adopters was the Judicial Conference of the United States, which sets the policy for all of the lower courts except, of course, the Supreme Court. And since that time, every other court in the U.S., state and federal, they have all adopted some version of the Code of Judicial Conduct, and the only holdout is the U.S. Supreme Court. And why they've held out, they've never actually explained, except they don't want to. Being the Supreme Court creates a lot of discretion. And so the Constitution doesn't say anything about the requirements for justices when it comes to ethics. The Constitution is really extraordinarily silent about the Supreme Court. It says there will be one Supreme Court, the justices will have life tenure, and that their compensation cannot be diminished while they're in office. And that's it. That's in Article 3. You look at Article 1, which sets up Congress, and it says very specifically, each House, Senate and House, will create their own rules of procedure. And those rules are not reviewable by a court because they're committed by the Constitution to each House of Congress. The difference is, for the Supreme Court, it doesn't even exist until Congress creates it And Congress, right from the beginning, from the Judiciary Act of 1789, sets the size of the Supreme Court, the term when it meets, the compensation. So if you're not a Supreme Court justice, it's pretty obvious under the Constitution that Congress could create a code or require a code from the Supreme Court. But then again, they're the court. How does it work now if you're a Supreme Court justice and there is a question about either ethics involving money, or even whether a justice should recuse from a case, who ultimately decides? There is a federal statute that governs disqualification and recusal. It's basically the same provisions as in the Code of Judicial Conduct. Now, the Supreme Court has never actually conceded that they have to follow that statute, but they pretty much have, or at least they've said that they pretty much have. But they have adopted a process in which each justice decides alone and unreviewably on their own disqualification. So the whole court never sees it, never gets to rule on it. This makes them, again, the only judges in the U.S. who have unlimited discretion to decide whether they're disqualified in a particular case. Just this month, all nine justices issued a statement in which they said that a justice may, when announcing recusal, give a reference to the relevant section of the Code of Judicial Conduct. That's what they said. Do you know how many times they have actually done that? You probably do. The answer is zero. They have never done it. So maybe they were making the statement going forward that in the future they would do it, except that four days later, Justice Jackson recused herself from a case and gave no explanation, no reference to the code. So how sincere they are about this reform is anybody's guess. But if there, say, is a clear conflict of interest that a justice may have with a case appearing before the court, and that justice just does not recuse him or herself, Is there any recourse or is it 
just their decision, and after that, nothing can be done. There is no recourse. It's their decision. After that, nothing can be done. Well, there, you could have impeachment, I suppose. Short of impeachment, nothing can be done. So what is the solution here? We talk about that when we come back. Steve, you mentioned earlier that Congress does have an oversight role. What can Congress do to impose certain accountability on the court if the court won't do it itself? Well, I think Congress has an oversight role. Congress probably thinks they have an oversight role. It's not obvious that the Supreme Court is going to grant that or agree with that if there is ultimately legislation. But I think that Congress could either require the court to adopt its own code, which seems to me to be the most sort of compromise solution. Congress isn't going to dictate what the code needs to be if the justices think they have particular reasons to write it one way or another, then they could go ahead and do that. Or Congress could create a code. And just as there are uh, financial reporting requirements and disclosure requirements under statutes, there could be a statute that actually imposes a code. I don't think there would be much inclination in Congress to do that, but I think that's a possibility. And a third possibility would be to require uh, the full court to rule on disqualification motions. Now, that one is clearly within congressional authority. Instead of each justice deciding by themselves whether or not they're disqualified, the motion would be referred to the entire court. When it comes to recusal from cases where a justice might have a conflict of interest? Yeah, exactly. So disqualification is the term that's used in the statutes. Recusal, it means the same thing. Now, that's clearly within, I think, the authority of Congress, because Congress, right in the Constitution, can set the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court, decides what's within and not within Supreme Court jurisdiction, except for a very narrow band of cases. So saying how particular motions are to be handled, I think is something Congress could do. You said earlier that you aren't sure that the Supreme Court would accept Congress's authority. And I think we saw a bit of that when Chief Justice Roberts sent a rather forceful letter to the chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee saying he wouldn't testify and then saying why he wouldn't appear. You've written critically about that. Right. I, I thought uh, the chief was not being straightforward when he said that. He said that only twice had chief justices ever testified. But, you know, those are precedents. And um, the Senate invitation was actually for the chief or a designated associate justice to testify. And uh, Chief Justice Roberts just blew right past that. Associate justices have testified almost 200 times in the last 60 years, more than once a year. So there's no reason that someone couldn't have been there. So you've written about judicial ethics for years. You taught it. If you were able to say, this is what we ought to do, what would it be? Well, it would be what uh, Senator Tillis said at the recent hearing, Tom Tillis, Republican from North Carolina. He said, I hope the Supreme Court is watching this hearing, and I hope they'll take it to heart, and I hope they will adopt a code of conduct. Now, I would add to that, I hope they would figure out a way to make full court rulings on disqualification motions because that would give much greater credibility, create much greater uh, public confidence. Do you think that given the public attention and political pressure on the court that we're seeing now will actually force their hand that they will adopt some different standard? I think if they wanted to change, they would have done it already. Professor Stephen Lubit, thanks so much for talking with me. It's been a great pleasure, Wes. Anytime. Thanks for listening to us here at The Big Take. It's a daily podcast from Bloomberg and iHeartRadio. For more shows from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen. And we'd love to hear from you. Email us questions or comments to bigtake at bloomberg.net. The supervising producer of The Big Take is Vicki Bertolino. Our senior producer is Catherine Fink. Our producers are Michael Falero and Mo Barrow. Rafael Amsili is our engineer. 
Our original music was composed by Leo Sidrin. I'm Wes Kosova. We'll be back tomorrow with another Big Take. <laughs>